epigenetic inheritance. Uh, epigenetics are changes in genes other than in the fundamental uh, uh, nucleotides. Uh, they happen. I mean, uh, when, when a particular sort of human cell becomes a muscle cell, certain changes are made, and those changes are replicated. The descendants of muscle cells are muscle cells. The, uh, uh, generally, these markers are sort of erased uh, uh, in the reproductive cells, and things are reset to the proper uh, beginnings again. There are known cases, uh, not very common, where this does not always happen. There are a few cases known in mice, which is where it's been well studied, where uh, the epigenetic state of an allele is sometimes inherited into the next generation. As far as we know, all these cases involve basically recent genetic insertions. Uh, you know, something like a retrovirus has been inserted in a particular place. I mean, the most famous one, Goonie mice, was, uh, is, a, is from an insertion that actually happened in the 1950s in some mouse line. And in some places, the resetting does not happen properly. Now, other people are saying, well, maybe this explains why something bad happened to my father, grandfather, whatever, and somehow it marked the genes in a way that's hurting or perhaps helping me. I don't believe it. <sighs> For example, there was a recent study that claimed that we could make, they could make mice afraid of a certain scent, and then that was inherited in the next generation. I don't believe it. What would that take? I said, you would have to have the activation state of certain genes in the brain would have to be transmitted to the sperm in a controlled way that then cause things to happen in the next generation. I don't think there's any such mechanism. And I'll tell you, it's more complicated than that because you know, not only that, when you start changing these gene activation patterns, they have to be the right patterns at different times in development. So let's suppose there was a gene that becomes more activated when you say learn calculus. Or maybe most likely less activated, but at any rate. Uh, the point is that same gene is probably not going to you wouldn't want it to have a different activation state in early development because that would probably have some bad consequence. See, not only would this change has happened, they would have to be controlled as to what time they occurred. You want it to happen when you're older, not, not at early stages, which it would probably interfere with something. There's no way for this to happen. So adaptive transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, I don't think it exists. But a lot of people would like it to exist. Well. I, could, I have a long list of things I would like to exist, but most of them don't. Okay, uh, so my comment, forget about it. Uh, paper published in Ancient Neuroscience this week. This is the, this is the new trendy thing that we actually talked about this event last November. Uh, this is something nobody was expecting. Uh, male mouse sperm contains RNA that, yes, can actually change the expression pretty much from birth in the offspring. It's the only transmission mechanism that would be possible because it doesn't, as you point out, involve, you know, keeping the marks uh, in, the, in the germline cells. So it would still be kind of a trick. To... Oh, well, so the thing is, is that their argument is that it is a trick. You're only going to see it in situations where it would have high adaptive value, like, and then, then we trail off because we don't know how it works, but at least now we know that it's something like this does work. I have no idea how important it's going to be. I kind of, I know when you said it's not likely to be hugely important because it, because it, because of how, you know, wow, how could that possibly be? But there is now a mechanism. This is one of those weird things about molecular biochemistry. It's like, you know, if there's any way something could happen, you know, and it I know. Happens, it'll happen. But, you know. but, it, but it's still, you need a mechanism. If we're talking about a learning experience, now, if we're talking about something like starvation, which affects the whole body, I could imagine there would be a change in a state which would be at least somewhat transmitted with RNA. Sure. But it's harder for me to imagine how, let's suppose we've, made, we've taken some mice and run them through a maze, yeah. how that information is then transmitted to RNA in the germ cells. No, I agree. My, 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 uh, mouse running, mouse running. Maze running doesn't sound good for this. Uh, it would have to be something that would involve, you know, I could imagine deprivation or something. Starvation. Or stress. Those uh, sorts of things you could imagine. And really, starv you know, food shortage is something that happens to essentially everybody, every species, right, right. it sort of comes and goes. Yeah. It's not absolutely impossible. Uh, now, I don't, that doesn't mean it does happen yeah, in humans, well. but it's not absolutely impossible. But the idea of, the, th the, the thing that people are reaching out for the is... systematic differences of exploiting large population differences, obviously. Yeah, well, but they're also trying to, well, but sometimes individualistic things. They're saying, you know, like, I, I, I lead a twisted life because my dad grew up in the Depression. Yeah. I said, actually, nobody uses that one because everybody, so many people did, so it wouldn't be any fun because it doesn't work. But they're looking for things like that where learned experiences. Uh, 
I said, I said I could imagine it for something like starvation. Uh, in a very general way, I could imagine it for if you went from a situation in which infectious disease was a real threat to one in which it was less, I could imagine maybe you're tuning that up and down a little. I mean, I don't actually believe it, but at least I could imagine it. But for learned things, I can't see how it could possibly work. Right. Uh, yes? Well, I couldn't imagine how it could possibly work either until somebody, somebody come up with this. No, but, but you still have to get stuff transmitted from the brain oh, to the testes. Absolutely. And for some people, the separation is not as big as we would hope. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yes? Don't get me wrong, I'm not in any sense trying to defend the people who are looking for epigenetics as they hope for explaining basically everything, as you're saying. But I guess similarly, when somebody comes and says, forget about it, it makes them think uh, we know enough about this now to say that just saying forget about it probably isn't the best. Um, I guess our opinions differ. Because <laughs> I do at think that's. I think we need to keep an open mind about it. Things that, that, um, um, I, I'm willing to consider possibilities that even I think are crazy, and this is one of them. But I think it's crazy. Oh, I, I'm as I said, I'm not trying to defend the people who look at it as a big. Crazy. Well, I, I, I'm trying I to just... attack them. Okay, <laughs> I mean, when, when they had when that article by the guy who's saying I think the mice of you know that we've transmitted hereditary fear, I don't believe it. Oh, I don't tend to believe those things either, but I think. That when you say let's just rule it out the way it appears you're saying, you are in danger of committing the same sin, if you will, as people who um, are looking at for it as the next great hope for explaining everything. Uh, no. Yes. The meat is so powerful and appealing, especially to say journalists who cover science. That I think it, you know you have to have a measured response to it because pe people. That is my measured response. Will be that, yeah, of course that could be true. Well, my, my response is you're an idiot. No, that's my real response. That my measured response is forget about it. The response is not incorrect, but it may not be the most effective response. Uh, yeah, I've so had that happen. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, I for one appreciate you throwing the water on the epigenetic appearance meme. That's a good word for it. Um, particularly in the social sciences, uh, because of all the mechanisms, that's the least likely, because it requires, I mean, your cell specific <coughs> specificity, you remember something in your hippocampus, it's gonna be translated through the germline and remembered in the hippocampus um, of your offspring. I mean, it just seems, it does seem ridiculous. But the RNA transfer is long known from maternal, I mean, there's so much information. There's more examples in plants, but yes. Yes, and plants also adjust the biochemistry of the seeds and so forth based on the environment. So I don't think it's totally, I mean, that there's not some sort of environmental, but and the thing I want to throw back is what about uh, genomic imprinting, parent of origin, effects, <coughs> which have been shown in humans. Uh, so what is the mechanism? And that might just be in every cell well, that's easier to remember than brain-specific turn that this gene on or Yeah, off. I mean, we, we know something about that. We even have a theory that probably explains some of it, which involves, uh, uh, you know, intersexual conflict and conflict right. between children and so forth. But uh, <coughs> those, there are some, not as much as in some other uh, species like mice, but there are some, and, and failures of them are known to cause certain interesting genetic diseases like Engelman syndrome uh, and so forth. Uh, I don't know why some of them exist. Some of them look like they result from this conflict of interest. I mean, the things that, like the paternal things, are strongly expressed in the placenta, which the, the idea is that uh, if you have species that's, that's other than 100% monogamous, there's a conflict of interest between males and females. And there's a tendency for male alleles to want maximal resources devoted to this offspring, while the mother would like to give equal resources to each of her offspring. And for example, uh, Paternal alleles are are overexpressed in the placenta, which is in charge of grabbing resources for the baby, and so forth. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, by the way, there's other cases that don't really fit this, but there's some at least that are probably explained by that. And uh, it's they don't. I would say one reason they probably don't matter as much in humans as they do in mice is because there's a whole lot more paternal investment in humans than there is in mice. I know the evolutionists yes. that, that, that suggest that there might be. I'm sure to say that before we say. <coughs> completely forget about it, and I'm generally on the forget about it side, um, that there might, there is some mechanism for epigenetic. Oh yeah, 
but memory. but w w whether but that whether that is something that is any other than like if you say certain alleles are always set a certain way if they're from the father, is there any more difference to that? Does it depend upon the father's experience? I know of no evidence for that at this point. Uh, as I said, it doesn't seem as common because probably humans have less conflict of interest between the sexes than mice do. <coughs> Anything? Yeah? It sounded like you would entertain starvation as a potential environment that could be passed on. Response to it. Uh, but, but would you add more into the bucket of in, what else would be in that bucket that you would at least entertain as a... I can imagine, which is not the same as saying that I necessarily believe it, that you, if you have things, if you have things, circumstances that affect the reproductive organs, that, that, you know, like starvation, which affects everything in the body, that there could be something changed which could be transmitted. Of course, the next question is whether it would ever be advantageous to do so. With plants, for example, one of the things is very often the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The, the correlation between environments is tends to be higher for sessile organisms than for ones that move around. So it's easier to predict. It might be make more sense to adjust things for the next generation. Whereas in humans, you know, the, the strongest thing you could say is that you know, good times cause famine and famine cause good times in a Malthusian world. I mean, the best way to have more to eat is if everybody's just died. You know, a good year, a, a few good years, perhaps means that things are going in the other direction. Yes? Uh, there is a, I think there is an epidemiologist at New York University who has data of uh, people in the Netherlands who uh, survived the hunger with them. Yes. So there you have your starvation data. Uh, there would be lots more. We can go to China and look at the people who survived the Great Leap Forward. We could probably find a few more of them, or somewhat more recently. Um, the other thing, the hunger, the hunger winter is interesting, though, because it is a short period, and it's also well understood, and there's lots of good information. We know some things, like, for example, the, uh, the people who were in that year class, the draft, they weren't any shorter. But they were, they did have something like twice the incidence of schizophrenia. And that also happened in the Great Leap Forward on a much more large scale, unfortunately. But, uh, so, you know, there are certainly bad things that can happen. Now, this isn't the same as being transmitted in the next generation, but, you know, or, or, you know drastic early differences in uh, nutrition certainly can have impacts. But, but, yeah, that would be a place to look at because now we would have the next generation. The, the same group, by the way, now is the longest in the world. Study the longest? The average length of the people above the Great Rivers in Holland Oh yeah, they're what, 5'10", average who, or something? Who, uh, who, who are descendants, I suppose, of people who underwent the underwent it. They are, yeah. on average, the longest in the world. Because of that? Who knows? Uh, what about big pestilences? Like, um, um, Ruban Plague, for example. It came kind of the waves. The things that, uh, well, I think I'm out of time, but I'll steal some. The uh, what we know is that after the Black Plague, nutrition went up because there was more, more I wasn't like... I was thinking about starvation. I was thinking about the thing well, the point is with the Black Plague, you see, this would, if you have to have survivors. Now, if you got the Black Plague, your chance of surviving was not very good. Now, could there have been effects among the children of the survivors? I guess it's possible, but I'll tell you that not many people survived the Black Plague. If you got it at all, you usually died. But there would be other things, less serious, for which there could be such a thing. Now, why, why any of these would impact on the questions we're most interested in, basically behavioral things, it's not particularly obvious. No, yeah. But it's, I, it's, look, it's a big world. Uh, so what is the notification about like, the, the tongue in there? So that's Berkeley away from Columbia University. And so he actually has a paper where they looked at differences in the methylation patterns, but they don't have they found the children yet. They well, that, that would be the next step. Yeah, yeah but, but they look at differences between exposed and unexposed siblings, and what they found is that they found differences in IGF-2 DMR between exposed and exposed siblings, and it was like 50 years up there. I'm not surprised. Well, occurred. like, why do you think Audrey Hep Hepburn could keep that svelte figure? She was in. Yeah, exactly. She was so in she the was hunger winter. I mean, not as a baby, but you know, she, she was starving in Holland at that time, and it can affect people. And the one thing that I know is that some of those differences which were found were in imprinted genes, but then if they looked at global methylation patterns, they didn't find anything. 
So, I mean, we don't know for sure, but the case is that it's I'm just saying that uh, any mechanism to me has got to be something that affects the body as a whole mm -hmm. for it to register, because I don't think there's a special mechanism that transmits what you learn and what you think into your genes. It would be very hard to do so. Mm -hmm. 